Hello, hello everyone, and welcome to all our participants worldwide. Your group is pleased to welcome you today to a new live market briefing on MCU supply chain swings. I am Faisal El Kamasi, Senior Global Sales Support Manager at your group, and I will guide you during this webinar. This live market briefing will talk about manufacturing capacity, the curse of the golden part, oversupply and other related descriptions. We will also cover some of the market impacts, current and future. So I would like to introduce you to our speaker, Tom Ackerberg, principal analyst in computing and software at YOL Intelligence, part of YOL Group. Before we get started, let me remind you that you can submit questions to our analysts during all the events, all the live events, using the Q&A box at the bottom of the screen. Question will be answered right after the presentation. In case we don't have to time to answer all of them, we will follow up with you by email. To conclude, this live event is recorded you will find the replay and presentation on our website next Monday. Now, let's start the live market briefing. Tom, the floor is yours. Thank you, Faiso. Uh, just for some housekeeping, I uh, just want to verify that the presentation is uh, displayed for you normally. Faiso? Yes, it's the case. OK. Thank you very much, everyone. Uh, welcome to our live market briefing on microcontroller supply chain swings. Uh, I would like to this, um, offer you today a view of what I'm going to talk about here. We'll go through the mega trends affecting the MCU supply chain, talk a little bit about the uncertainty and the fluctuations. Just, uh, Tom, just, just a second. We, we can't yes. see the presentation, so we're just taking about that. OK. I, yeah. Let's just, let's, we can't see the slides. And let's. I don't know if it's from your hand or not, Tom, or? Uh, let's uh, let's check. Interesting. Okay. Okay, it should be okay now. Okay, Tom, it should be fine. Sorry, Excellent. everybody, for this technical problem. <laughs> Thank you very much for your patience. So, all right. So today I'm going to talk a little bit about the supply chain and why the. Uh, uncertainty in the supply chain at the moment, uh, different fluctuations, the mo me global megatrends that are driving these changes, um, a little bit better news since all of the news seems to be pretty dismal at the moment, uh, some critical analysis of the imbalances in detail in various markets, and then finally the overall message and uh, what to do if you want more information. So let's begin talking about the megatrends. Uh, in the, uh, the market, we're looking at inflation, uh, the reactions to the COVID-19 pandemic, which is uh, stimulating most of the megatrends going on right now. The workforce imbalance, our uh, manufacturing capacity shortages, which, is, which have been uh, most of the news about the semiconductor industry lately, uh, geopolitical unrest, uh, semiconductor manufacturing incentivization, and moving towards a new normal. So um, what we want to deal with is why uh, the supply chain imbalances exist and um, some a little bit about the, uh, the details that are not necessarily what you hear in the mainstream news. So 
Almost all markets, especially the semiconductor industry, are currently in a state of unprecedented unpredictability. But today, we'll focus on the MCU market alone. The message I wanted to emphasize is that part of the solution is that different markets are in different states of disruption, and there's not a one-size-fits-all solution. For the last few years, markets have risen and fallen in ways that do not align with historic data. The digital age has been struck by a global pandemic for the first time and is having to veer from precise business models supported by decades of data while adjusting to supply chain disruptions in real time. The market has had decades of trends data to develop models for an efficient, just-in-time supply chain that optimize profit by reducing inventory, optimizing workforces, optimizing the manufacturing and shipping process, and basically reducing time to market. The COVID-19 global pandemic took this fine-tuned machine and smashed it. The inability to use the typical supply demand models developed over decades due to unknown consumer reactions and unpredictable workforces created the conditions we are currently experiencing. This uncertainty is a self-sustaining problem and is further complicated by underestimating demand, overreacting to shortages, and global strife, global trade challenges, and global inflation. We're dealing with pain points resulting from the shock to the system and the world market's reaction to that shock. Part of the problem is making critical decisions on general perceptions that may or may not apply to specific market supply and demand. Since the beginning of the COVID-19 global pandemic, supply chains have been disrupted, including the microcontroller market, OEM struggled with this unpredictable workforce. They tried to predict changes in demand as consumers left work to quarantine. Would suppliers be able to fulfill their commitments? While some markets were adjusting with incredible increases in demand due to a changing working environment, health and safety precautions or similar effects, some suffered from the changes in the societal, societal reconfiguration or just an overly cautious consumer. Not all responses to the market dynamics were optimal and some led to making matters worse. Especially in automotive where orders were canceled, workforces were quarantined or furloughed, shipping routes were impacted, Demand for specific markets fluctuated wildly, and in many cases, manufacturing capacity was stressed beyond the capability to accommodate the unforeseen demand. While most market watchers were able to share the overall effects, such as order delays or rapidly rising prices, uh, other supply chain trends overall, the reality is that individual markets have recently been diverging in very different ways. These differences are crucial and are the point of Yol's live market briefing today. Many of today's global market trends are in some way attributable to the effects of COVID-19 and its many sub-variants. Some countries, most notably mainland China, are still challenged by the pandemic. The virus itself still disrupts both consumerism and the workforce availability. In many cases, the quarantines and regulations to get the coronavirus under control are having a detrimental effect on the economies. While Europe, North America, and many other nations have mostly reopened their economies, the lingering effects and those countries still fighting to eliminate the outbreaks are still impacting the semiconductor market, including microcontrollers. Real GDP and advanced economies collectively have swung wildly from 1.7 in 2019 to down 4.4 in 2020 as a pandemic surged, jumping back to 5.2 in 2021 as people adapted to working at home and back to 2.4 in 2022 
based on International Monetary Fund. Inflation now appears to be the leading mega trend influencing markets and government policies. As supply chains slowly build back toward a new normal, evolving demand is challenging our perception of what is normal. Even government policies to protect the livelihood of citizens with government subsidies can fuel this trend as the market continues to struggle to keep up with consumer demand for an evolving lifestyle. Consumer and business resources were buoyed, but supply chain had not yet caught back up to driving, uh, caught back up, driving current inflation factors. In 2020, average consumer price change was uh, 0.7, rising to 3.1 in 2021, and then 7.2 in 2022, according to the IMF. Increasing interest rates are being leveraged, but until supply chains can grow to meet demand, many markets will remain susceptible to inflationary impacts and consumer spending trends could change directions in unpredictable ways. The IMF predicts inflation rate to drop over the next couple of years, which is good for our markets and is a good sign for long for the long-term dynamics of the microcontroller market. In addition to the residual effects of the pandemic, global conflicts and trade policies are creating both global and regional scarcity and forcing the markets to adjust supply chains to adapt. While most of these visible trends lead to a very negative prognosis for the market, the reality is less doom and gloom. Vaccinations and treatments for COVID-19 have been successful enough to enable people to return to normal living conditions. While a few regions still struggle to reach a critical threshold of vaccinations and otherwise virus-resistant population, it appears to be just a matter of years or less. While global inflation is creating a lot of worry, the IMF are predicting to it to moderately come back down toward manageable levels in the next couple of years. Uh, we're already seeing some in, uh, indications that the inflation rates are are lower than what was predicted for the end of 2022. As workforces appear to be returning to normal, supply chains have become more predictable and adaptive. Uh, toward new supply and demand balance. The shift toward work at home as well as strong trends toward more automated workforces will create a new supply and demand model, but drastic unexpected shifts are expected to diminish and en uh, enable a return to a just-in-time supply chain model. While average demand still appears to outweigh supply, Globally, government subsidies and policies have incentivized a significant investment in new manufacturing capacity in more mature economies. While this will take years to relieve pressure, it will do much to reduce the current imbalance contributing to supply chain disruptions and inflation, as well as reducing the drastic increase in pricing that we've seen over the last couple of years due to the supply chain imbalance. The lingering problems are expected to dampen growth in 2023, but long-term, much of the pressure will be released and the global economy will, will be better prepared for a period of strong recovery. So let's, Instead of talking uh, about the supply chain as a global unit, uni unity, let's talk about a few markets in detail so you can see where these divergences come. So the microcontroller is the most shipped processor. It permeates almost every electronic application market. Each market has its unique and uh, demand structure with variance in time to market, advanced planning, life cycles, market elasticity, and pain points. 
microcontrollers compete differently from other processors for manufacturing capacity. This is important in understanding why there's a difference in the overall uh, news about supply chain capacity and the microcontroller market in general. The lower cost and moderate complexity of microcontrollers can shape choices in ordering stockpiling and substitution decisions differently than other processors. Um, OEMs are willing to take a little bit more risk in stockpiling these very low cost uh, items to prevent uh, shortages while, or um, other disruptions. So the supply chain can't be blamed entirely on the current market shortfalls. So let's take a look at some of these detailed markets. The automotive, we'll start with the automotive market. The automotive market is the largest revenue generator for microcontrollers. Most of these are high reliability microcontrollers that frequently come compete for near cutting edge manufacturing process foundry capacity. It is also a market where demand still heavily outweighs supply. It is a very strong example of what's going on in the semiconductor industry where demand is outstripping supply. There are several contributing factors and the problem is very complex for automotive. This is an industry with a long time to market and long-term planning. When the pandemic struck, OEMs were forced to make long-term impactful responses to an unprecedented event. Thinking consumer spending would drastically decrease, many chose to downsize production, canceling component orders, delaying product releases, and closing factories and furloughing labor, all of which created a decline in MCU demand. <clears throat> However, consumer spending decreases were short-lived and demand increased as many consumers tried to avoid mass transit contact. Meanwhile, capacity once dedicated to automotive was shifted to a rapidly growing demand for consumer and personal data processing electronics. When automotive OEMs tried to readjust their decision, they found there was no capacity to reinstate their orders, and so component availability was stymied. Many high-end processors in automotive compete for manufacturing capacity at TSMC and other foundries with high performance CPUs and GPUs. Some stockpiling of components occurred in late 2021 to avoid compounding back orders, especially in general purpose microcontrollers. This contributed to a dip in early 2022, even though there are still individual component imbalances and back orders occurring. Today, component orders are near pre-pandemic levels, but foundries are at capacity and backordered parts still occasionally plague this industry. A system as complex as an automobile may be almost fully assembled with hundreds of semiconductors installed while it waits for that golden part. And by golden part, the industry uh, uses this term to describe any component that prohibits the final production. This scenario has OEMs manufacturing more vehicles with fewer features to avoid some of the higher risk components. OEMs are ramping up production, but at a slower than demand model would predict due to the complexity of adjusting to the new just-in-time order process. While supply may be a bottleneck, the demand side continues to grow rapidly as the industry evolves significantly. Electrification, advanced driver assistance, and digitally enhanced user experiences are all driving consumer interest and increased semiconductor content. In some ways, the discontinuing certain product lines has been uh, strategic as globally Consumer interest in electrification has grown dramatically over the last couple of years. As production ramps anew, look for a significantly higher share of new vehicle models to be electric. As a key takeaway to this uh, 
market. Because of the complexity of the automotive supply chain, OEMs must perform a tightrope walk to ramp production to meet evolving demand amidst competition for foundry capacity over the next year or two. After that, we're going to see a significant amount of new capacity online, which should help to lower prices, reduce supply chain imbalance, and overall allow the market to grow to the abilities of the demand in the uh, new just-in-time model. For microcontrollers in personal data processing, we look at the data processing used to, uh, to provide uh, to the province of off or data processing used to be the province of offices and data centers. The growth of personal computers at home, smartphones, tablets, smart wearables, and the myriad of peripherals to support these devices has created a unique segment of consumer electronics centered around internet connectivity and data processing. For the microcontroller market, the largest demand in this space is in the many peripherals shown here as other personal data processing on this chart. This includes keyboards, mice, headsets, personal printers, webcams, chargers, and many more uh, electronics supporting the data processing market for consumer goods. The MCUs targeting these devices, many of which are general purpose multi-market designs, we're not nearly as impacted by foundry capacity shortages since most are manufactured on more mature processes. Design cycles are as short as six to 12 months, so product designs can be more adaptable as well. So personal data processing has historically been a growth opportunity, but consumer response to the pandemic drove demand growth into overdrive. As workers were sent home to work and companies discovered that they could remain viable with a stay-at-home workforce, investment in the home office personal electronics grew from both a work requirement and a personal user experience choice. This demand throughout 2020 and early 2021 led many OEMs to ramp up production and stockpiling of components. Unfortunately, this mega trend was shorter lived than expected, as everyone who needed this equipment had likely already gotten it by 2021. OEMs found themselves with too much overstock and orders for MCUs in early 2022 plummeted for this market. To make matters worse, the strong buying in the last two years means that the replacement cycles of these devices that are anywhere from two to four years frequently, are depressed, are depressed demand for 2022 and 2023 before any return to normal. Even after 2023, these products are likely to further exhibit wild swings as the trends uh, return to a, a more spread cycle of replacement and a saturated market. This market is more impacted by hyper demand during the pandemic and overstock than supply chain disruptions. A key takeaway is that this market being impacted by hyper demand during the pandemic is causing a cycle reset and overstock rather than any serious supply chain disruptions. Uh, in the consumer electronics market, like personal data processing, consumer electronics has also been impacted by hyper demand during the pandemic, causing a cycle reset again and overstock rather than serious supply chain disruptions. During the pandemic lockdowns, more time was spent at home. More attention was placed on improving the personal experience of working at home. While some businesses and workers were severely harmed by the pandemic, many found themselves with a new lifestyle and income that seemed sustainable, and so spent money to adjust to their new lifestyle, which frequently meant new home automation, new home AV and networking equipment, fitness wearables, and other consumer electronics. 
the pandemic induced hyperbolic buying cycle seemed even more of a surprise to OEMs when it ended because the level of overstock seemed more severe. A key takeaway in this market is that inflation fears and replacement cycle resets are a strong deterrent for growth in consumer electronics through 2023, but with a shorter life cycle, the path to normalcy should be quicker beginning in 2024. In the industrial electronics market, it, it's a varied and diverse market in, ranging from manufacturing, building and uh, automation, uh, retail, uh, industrial, mining, a wide variety of goods, and includes uh, applications that are highly disparate and frequently cl more closely tied to GDP trends than consumer megatrends, other than consumer goods manufacturing. Industrial characteristically incorporates long-term design cycles and includes many applications with very long equipment longevity. These characteristics help to buck wild temporary swings in microcontroller demand. Because of the long-term design cycles, the industrial market is more resilient to these wide megatrends of consumer markets, and the diverse applications are far less cyclical due to long-term development of applications. Most industrial applications use general purpose multi-market microcontrollers, though some applications require high, reliability, high reliability MCUs for harsh working conditions. This may include mining operations or motors and drives. Connectivity, sensors, and automated equipment, including new AI-enabled applications, are keeping a steady demand for microcontrollers in industrial applications and increasing the number of microcontrollers used per application. The pandemic impacted industrial applications more directly because of furloughs and factory closings, but the long-term design cycles make industrial more resilient to these wide megatrend swings. The stockpiling of general purpose microcontrollers did affect factory and retail applications, but not nearly as harshly as personal data processing or consumer markets. Inflation and rising interest rates can impact the industrial investment, but unless it's sustained, it is not likely to have a drastic impact. While the overall megatrends associated with the pandemic impacted industry, industrial applications in moderation, inflation and rising interest rates are more of an obstacle for this market than consumer spending habits. Uh, the supply chain uh, imbalance is not nearly as big a factor in this market. Another market to address is the smart card uh, and uh, embedded security market. The, this is a, also a very large market for microcontrollers. Uh, smart cards include MCUs and bank cards, ID cards, and similar account security protection applications, but by far the largest application has been SIM cards used in smartphones. The secure MCUs used in smart card applications are unique class of microcontrollers requiring fewer general purpose features, but integrate security related logic and require strict adherence to secure communications protocols. The overall smartphone market has matured but the spike during the pandemic created a similar residual decline as the replacement cycle reset in 2021 and will dampen 2022 and 2023 replacement demand. Even more significant in this market is the trend away from SIM cards in preference to eSIM and iSIM techniques for embedding security solutions in the smartphone. Demand for embedded secure MCUs are also being driven by trusted platform modules uh, upgrades in PCs. 
Demand for security specific microcontrollers are pen penetrating almost every vertical market that connects to the internet or uh, is uh, a high risk scenario for security. There is little supply chain disruption in this market as the manufacturing process is unique from the com competing foundry services. The graph you see here clearly exhibits the key takeaway in this market that the decline in this market resembles the impact on personal data processing market caused by the pandemic. But is what, what is more obvious is that there is a very strong growth trend for embedded security, including replacing SIM cards. So in conclusion, want to emphasize that overall, demand is still outstripping capacity in the semiconductor industry. And where microcontrollers compete for shared capacity, there are still supply shortages such as microcontrollers uh, in automotive. In the automotive market, the high performance, small process nodes compete with CPU and GPU markets for capacity. So until uh, foundry service capacity uh, is created, uh, these markets will still show the signs of a supply chain imbalance. Miscalculations of demand after the unprecedented global pandemic have led to shortages in markets like automotive, but stockpiling and overages in consumer-related markets are at odds with this trend. Global conflict and trade disruptions, global inflation, and other megatrends are depressing the markets for 2022 and are expected to continue through 2023 before they get better. It is this type of market impact rather than the supply chain shortage that will have the greatest effect on the microcontroller market due to its effect on the electronics that the microcontroller market supports. Despite these megatrends, many individual market demands for connectivity, sensors, security, and AI processing are still driving market-specific demand for MCUs. So if you like what you saw here and you would like more detailed information or you would like uh, conversations about this more personally, here's where to look. Uh, take a look at the microcontroller market monitor and talk to us about how that may meet your needs. Um, I thank you, and I'd like to turn this back over uh, to Faisal for our question and answers. Thank you. Thank you very much, Tom, uh, for your great presentation. Yes, as Tom was saying, yeah, we it's time for the Q&A session. We received many questions about, about it in the live Q&A box uh, that are about to answer now. So, Tom, let's start with this first question. Um, you talked about uh, multi-market MCUs, high reliability MCUs, and secure MCUs. Can you elaborate on what, is, what this means and why it matters? Sure. So, Microcontrollers are not all alike in the production process. And whether they compete with other semiconductors and how they compete is directly related to the manufacturing processes that they go through. High reliability classes of microcontrollers are, are run through a different manufacturing process because A, they tend to be higher performance and are designed around uh, cutting edge process nodes that are only one or two generations behind CPUs and GPUs. So they compete with those applications for foundry services. They also go through a much more stringent validation and testing process and may have even uh, more stringent 
uh, contractual obligations for meeting harsh operational conditions and prolonged lifestyles. In the meantime, at the very opposite end, we have uh, uh, smart card and secure microcontrollers, which are very stripped down versions of microcontrollers and are very application specific. They are frequently produced on much more mature process nodes and they require their own manufacturing processes set up uh, and they do not compete very well or, or they do not compete very often with um, higher performing microprocess, uh, microprocessing components like CPUs and GPUs. However, they are affected by end products uh, that may rely heavily on those other uh, supply chains. For example, smartphones, where the smartphones may be impacted by availability of uh, CPUs and GPUs um, that uh, impact may create a lower demand for secure microcontrollers. However, secure microcontrollers will show up in other product lines uh, more commonly, uh, like uh, entrusted platform solution, uh, uh, trusted platform modules. And finally, multi-market simply means all of these general purpose microcontrollers that can be used in several different applications. So um, they're easier to stockpile, they are easier to manufacture because they're on mature process nodes. And since they can support a number of different applications across many vertical markets, uh, they tend to be uh, a more common class of microcontroller and easier to uh, stockpile or substitute. So that's what we mean by those different classes. Okay, thank you. Uh, another question, uh, Tom. Are there uh, significant, significant uh, difference regionally in, in this market swings? Yeah, so as we looked at some of these markets, they uh, tend to have a regional focus. For example, many of the consumer goods that we get are actually assembled in mainland China. So uh, the uh, market impact uh, of COVID-19 as mainland China continues to struggle with lockdowns uh, will impact the workforce availability, uh, will impact manufacturing of microcontrollers um, in mainland China. Secure microcontrollers are frequently uh, produced uh, more in the uh, European Middle East region, uh, so there are some re regional differences that uh, we do address in the microcontroller market monitor. Thank you. Uh, one more question. Um, so uh, AI demands increases. So um, relationships uh, between MCU and AI, that's the question. If AI increase, MCU demand should increase. Does it make sense? Yes, a very good question. So the, the general perception is that AI is targeted towards data centers and training machine learning and high-end vision applications. But there are a lot more applications that can benefit and even new applications that didn't exist before that can benefit from AI actually run in tiny ML or other algorithms that are easily targeted to low resource processors like microcontrollers. So what we're seeing is a greater demand for AI to be used in maintenance applications, for example, in industrial applications where the health of a very vital uh, uh, application like manufacturing equipment or uh, mineral processing or even uh, robotics can uh, can be uh, addressed with sensors regarding temperature and vibration and other applications that can easily use AI algorithms 
running in a microcontroller. So AI uh, can also address uh, understanding natural language uh, processing and many other applications that didn't necessarily exist before. So AI is not just for high performance processors. There's a whole new market opening up for microcontrollers addressing artificial intelligence. Okay, thank you. Thank you, Tom. Um, one more question. Um, can you comment more on the uh, long-term forecast? Yes, yeah, so the focus of today's um, briefing was mainly around the last couple of years and the impacts and what that means up to 2023. Um, we do forecast the microcontroller markets out through uh, 2027. Um, a five-year forecast. Uh, and uh, what we're seeing is with the uh, advent of more semiconductor manufacturing foundry services uh, due to come online in 2024, 2025, while most of those foundry services are, are going to be targeted at uh, many other semiconductor components, including high performance processors, it will still reduce the impact of competing for manufacturing capacities across the semiconductor market. This in turn will have an effect on releasing capacity more for uh, microcontrollers. It will also have the effect of starting to bring down pricing that was driven up drastically during the pandemic. Right now, we're looking at microcontroller pricing at around uh, growing, having grown from about 67 cents on average back in 2019 up to 77 cents now. We're expecting long term that the pricing will drop to, say, 75 cents on average. The growth rate across the board will uh, grow more dramatically over the uh, 24, 24 through 2027, uh, giving us uh, a uh, growth rate overall in the next five years uh, uh, around the, the middle single digits. Okay. Um, is, uh, is MCU migrating towards more advanced processing nodes? So there, it's a good question. There are two trends going on right now in microcontrollers where they are actually diverging. And one of those divergences is, uh, is addressing the question that you proposed and that it is growing in performance and becoming more and more competitive with applications processors and other system on chip solutions. So what we're seeing are multi-core solutions, which, which we're tracking. Uh, and that can be either symmetric multi-core where we see multiples of the same core architecture in a single microcontroller, or even asymmetric multi-cores where we see sort of a big little structure going on, even in a microcontroller addressing different parts of the application. We're also seeing a much greater uh, core base performance level where microcontrollers are capable now of running uh, mobile or embedded operating systems, much like an SOC. So there is an overlap and it's becoming very popular of higher performance microcontrollers that are taking the place of low end system on chip solutions uh, where that's available because microcontrollers can be easier to program and less expensive to fulfill the needs of those applications. On the other end, we're still also seeing many microcontrollers moving in the other direction, trying to become more power efficient, uh, smaller, cheaper, and uh, addressing applications that maybe didn't exist before based on uh, power demands. Okay, thank you. And uh, we still have time maybe for one or two questions. Uh, let's, let's have this one. Uh, are MCU uh, logic CMOS based or based on BCD platforms? 
And are there analog devices in the chip? Uh, yeah, so microcontrollers are uh, tend to be CMOS, uh, um, and there are definitely analog applications that are embedded. In fact, microcontrollers, uh, the the entire microcontroller market growth over historic uh, historically was in an effort to bring in all of those uh, functions the, and varying input output app, uh, connectivity from the board level into the microcontroller. Um, this is also one of the reasons that microcontrollers are produced on more mature process nodes is because of all of the analog and RF content that doesn't scale well down to cutting edge process nodes. So yes, microcontrollers are definitely uh, frequently constructed around being able to support analog input output solutions and onboard analog, including RF transceivers and, and, and uh, other uh, integrated functionality into the microcontroller. However, I will say that uh, at uh, cutting edge microcontrollers, there are still a number of microcontrollers that may not have any of these analog solutions that are simply there to do um, certain housekeeping tasks that are completely in the digital domain. So it is a widely wide variety field. Okay, great. Thank you, Tom. Um, let's maybe have this last question uh, as we are running off time. Uh, what regarding the pandemic caused all of the store, the, the short, the shortage? Yeah, so we talked about it a little yes. bit. So let me elaborate a little bit more to answer this question. Um, when the pandemic, uh, what, when it was clear that the pandemic was upon us and that we were going to have to deal with workforce shortages, people being furloughed, factories potentially closing, retail organizations potentially closing, even small businesses, people being forced to quarantine uh, away from the place of work. A lot of companies had to make decisions on whether they would stay open, uh, whether they would reduce production, whether they would cancel products. Um, a lot of these decisions were made without the ability to look at historical data because uh, prior pandemics really occurred before the digital age and there were not significant models on how we would react in terms of our demand for electronics during this type uh, of work uh, environment or, or, and this type of consumerism. So what happened was many companies made decisions about uh, reductions in uh, ordering uh, for factories that they were uh, either reducing production or closing down entirely. So orders made for microcontrollers dropped off significantly. However, at the same time, other companies were actually uh, ramping up production, whether it was because they were already scheduled to do so from long-term planning and they needed to maintain a schedule for business operations, or maybe they felt that they could take advantage of needs during the pandemic, such as uh, consumer medical devices or something. One of the biggest uh, one of the biggest pandemic-induced supply chain disruption problems was the automotive industry canceling a very large number of high-performance processing orders due to shuttering many factories and, um, and delaying the production of new vehicle models thinking that the consumer markets would not have the money to spend on automobiles and were tightening their budgets or uh, didn't want to get out much, uh, this seemed like a pretty logical solution. But in reality, um, 
people's budgets didn't necessarily need to be tightened as much as was originally predicted uh, due to subsidy, government subsidies or the work at home environment being so successful. And people found themselves with, uh, with uh, a fund savings that they had preparing for the pandemic and thinking that they didn't want to do mass transit anymore or expose themselves to other people and buying an automobile made sense. So there was a huge increase in demand in automobile sales uh, rather than uh, a, sh um, a shrinking of demand. When the OEMs went back to try and re renew their orders that they had canceled, they found that the, the uh, Boundary services had reallocated that capacity away from those canceled orders to new markets that were growing tremendously based on the pandemic or were new releases such as Apple's M1 processor uh, taking up all of that available uh, capacity. So now we had a huge increase in the consumer market and a complete supply chain shortage in automotive, leading to uh, many delayed parts uh, for automotive production, but huge growth in uh, personal computers, smartphones, and things like that. So this is what how the pandemic created such an imbalance. Thank you. Thank you for the, the answer. The live market briefing is now ending. Thank you to our speaker, Tom, for his time and analysis. Thank you also to all of you for your participation and for your question. Uh, please let me just remind you that you can find all how products, tear downs and reverse costing reports, technology and market reports, and how quarterly data monitors on our website, www.yallgroup.com. And feel free to subscribe to All How Communication to stay informed of our latest news and product launch. Finally, I would like to remind you that the replay video and presentation will be available next Monday on How website. Do not hesitate to contact us if you have additional questions. Thank you all for joining us today. Have a good day and take care. Thank you, everyone.